Only two questions. One, are cooperatives still relevant in Western Canada? The existential question. And two, why don't we see new co-ops being created the way we did in the 70s and the 80s? Where the co-ops gone? So, to answer these questions, the research team with the SIP project reached out to over 2,000 Western Canadians in these communities. They conducted over 300 interviews with community administrators, and we held 26 community meetings. That was my job. We also interviewed co-op experts in each province. Familiar faces like Seth in Alberta, Vera in Manitoba, Murray Frost here in Vancouver. And the findings really reaffirmed um, what a lot of folks in the co-op sector kind of already knew. The study showed overwhelmingly that cooperatives are still relevant. <laughs> There's very strong interest in community-based solutions in every community that we reach out to. Uh, rural, close to cities, indigenous, Métis, all of them. However, our data show that people simply don't understand how a cooperative business model can be applied to the challenges that are very real and are facing their communities right now. When asked, do you know what a cooperative is, 23% of rural respondents and 41% of indigenous respondents said no. Absolutely no idea, no concept of what a co-op is. The research also shows that those who were familiar with co-ops had an extremely narrow view of what a co-op is. Most folks simply just identified with, with co-op stores. And of course, here in Western Canada, are extremely prevalent, especially uh, around here with friends in Saskatchewan. And beyond that, folks were really limited to credit unions, cooperative insurance, and how's it cost mainly here or mainly. So, with a very narrow view, folks really didn't have a good sense of how they could take the cooperative business model and apply it to these challenges that they're facing. The data also showed us some of the needs of these companies that are facing. And based on my experience, these are extremely well aligned. business development, um, there's a host of needs, but these are some of the top ones with healthcare by far in the next one. So the project concluded uh, with a, that concerted effort was needed to increase understanding of cooperatives throughout Western Canada to support a new generation of co-op development. And that was the phrase that my that kind of CEO of SEL Scott made that. And with the results of that project, SCL committed to creating and funding the cooperative stores. So, any questions before I move on to this next section of our talk? I always take silence as a sign that I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> So in this next section, I'll just give a quick overview of our goals. I kind of touched on them a little bit, but I'll dig into that a little bit more to talk about our strategy, the tools and processes that we've developed, and how that all works together to advance co-op education, and eventually, hope co-op development. So, as I mentioned, we should really start a basketball team as well at the same height. Identified as areas of particularly limited institutional support. 
certainly when we see when we look at the data on co-ops that have been developed in Western Canada over the last 10 years, we see they're the trend. They're mostly urban. So there's good supports there. Um, rural indigenous communities not so much significantly in indigenous communities. Um, we always try to ensure that the supports we provide are designed to meet our audiences where they are. We strive to help people learn in a way that the way they want to learn and speak in a language they understand. So we try to create a customer journey that's seamless. And we engage key stakeholders within the co-op sector as well as new audiences that are critical to the new cooperative businesses and getting our message these four ideas, we're going to understand how we can tackle those two goals. With engaging rural audiences, indigenous audiences, creating a seamless journey, and stakeholder engagement. Any questions about the goals or high level what we're doing? Because now I'm going to get to the real specifics. Also, I'm going to get this place, eh? <laughs> this morning, they say it's okay, you might die. Black Lake, Black Lake, Saskatchewan. It's a cool place. So, next up, I'll take you through the tools that we created. I'll touch on some of the tools, but how they kind of work together uh, within our education education process. So, <laughs> first up, we have a host of outreach tools. Um, Outreach tools simply being usually the first contact point that we have with folks. Certainly, in person conferences are one of them, and they really just contribute a fraction of the folks that we get in front of on a daily basis. Um, without a doubt, one of the most useful tools is social media. You can find us on our five social media platforms. And if you check us out on our Instagram or TikTok, <laughs> we do have a TikTok account. Uh, you may even see me dancing. <laughs> Anything to spread the word about co-ops. <laughs> More importantly, using those sorts of platforms as well as our websites, lets us use analytics. And we really incorporate the data into our communication strategy to inform the key words, the ideas, and the questions that folks have and are coming to us with. Um, so that allows us to, again, better get in front of folks and get co-ops into that conversation. And what we found works best through our blogs, our podcasts, find stories, our project called the Backroad Diaries, and our newsletters, all of which you can find on our website, uh, are that people most identify with stories. People want explanations, they want to understand processes and how things work, but story formats are definitely that. And I shot a for a colleague Ace the other day, but she's distinguishing our, our storytelling blogs first, telling the stories of the clients we work with. As well as something made in the last And what we found using the analytics is that just by looking for examples or stories and asking questions, we have about 2,000 people per week who are coming to our website to access this information. So, for this reason, we create that content to focus on issues that matter to our target audiences and incorporate those examples that we really identify with Yes, please. <laughs> Stakeholders we work with, you guys kind of, if you're interested in what we're doing, that's the best one. 
We have another newsletter called Three Good Ideas, designed specifically for economic developers, consultants, and business support organizations. And another one for indigenous entrepreneurs and community leadership. We also offer free webinars. Who doesn't love a free webinar? <laughs> and while co-ops are part of that conversation regularly, more often they're not. Because we design those specifically for the challenges and the pain points that we know folks are facing. We want to talk about barriers to starting the business on reserve. We want to talk about how indigenous farmers can access financing, purchase land in a complex environment. We want to talk about how art can be a part of some of your downtown economic development strategy. Those sorts of uh, webinars really great and then start great conversations and again it's how we start wedging cooperatives in the conversation. Usually our average webinar will attract 50 to 60 people and we put them up on YouTube and social media and website and they get a lot of them for you to like that. In addition to the stories we tell and conversations we start, we know the tools and resources are something that people go through. Yeah, no, no I know, I'm going to trip up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we know that tools and resources are things that folks look for, especially because we know well, what's the most common thing people search when they want to search. Can't, they can't hear me. Through the audio or just... I don't know how to fix that. Mm. Oh, it has gone. He's coming. He's coming. Yeah. He's coming back. Yeah. yeah. Just be louder. Be louder. Okay. okay. I'll just uh, I'll try and speak a little bit louder. I think that's that's good. Okay. We know that the number one question that folks search, other than what is a co-op, is how do I start a co-op? And with that, we know what keywords we need to include in tools and resources to get folks to our websites. But we also recognize, as folks that want to start cooperative businesses that there is, a, there was a bit of a gap in the tools and resources available and templates and how-to guides for starting cooperative businesses. Early in the days of Cooperative First, when we were putting together some of our processes, some of the tools, you know, we were working with groups, I would look for some sample bylaws for folks, and I kind of had to put things together with a mishmash of, uh, I think a great template I had was from the Saskatchewan Co-op Association, but it was fairly bare bones. Uh, we had another one from the University of Wisconsin. Not sure if that one complied fully with Canadian laws. There we go. Now, now we're cooking. Um, not sure if that one complied with Canadian laws. And then I would just piecemeal things together. So that led to the project for us for creating the Co-op Creator, which is our resource website, just coopcreator.ca. And it's our A to Z guide for folks that are interested in starting a cooperative right from literally how to organize a community meeting, to here's the full process for incorporating a cooperative in each of the four community provinces, as well as federally, with sample bylaws if you want them, uh, through to governance tools like here's how to put together an EGM agenda and how to get word out there for it. Excuse me. Okay, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> no worries, we're good, we're all good. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, we also created another initiative called Your Way Together um, that focuses specifically on the policy, the pain points, and how to navigate the regulations when starting a cooperative on reserve. Because it's a vastly different process. There's a series of different legislation that groups can opt into that drastically changes the startup process, uh, even from one nation to the next working with groups on White Cap First Nation, where they've opted out of the Indian Act for several sections, is completely different from working with the Pierre Ballantyne Cree Nation um, up in Pelican Narrows. Big learnings, and that really informs some of that work. Uh, and this site, the co-op creator, usually attracts about 1,500 people per week, and all those tools, I should say, are all free. Uh, we've had some partnerships with this where folks want to translate these tools, uh, we know some folks that do consulting work or active work um, use those tools and by all means have at it. Yes, sir. I just thought I'd give a plug to you guys. So um, Minnesota Indigenous Business Alliance actually took 
uh, your way together and adapted it um, uh, increasingly by bringing the public doing together. So that's doing similar work for First Nations folks yeah. in Minnesota. Oh, fabulous. That is music to my ears. I'll be passing that along to the team. Awesome. Very cool. So these are some of the more technical resources that we provide, and it really helps support our online courses. It helps attract people. Oddly enough, we get a lot of hits from the Philippines with the co-op creator. A lot of governance tools are needed in the Philippines, I suppose. Um, but it also helps us in our day-to-day -day work because we don't really need to be looking for those resources. When we get a question from a client saying, hey, we have our first AGM, how do we fix these bylaws? Here's the tool. We got you. Next up. <laughs> Next up, we ask folks to engage with us in a bit more of an in-depth way. Make a little bit more of a commitment. And we do that through our free online courses and our online workshops. And that really consists of four different learning platforms. The big one that's been around for, for quite a while is our Creating Connections Workshop, which is designed specifically for economic development professionals, business agencies uh, like Small Business BC, Business Link in Alberta, uh, as well as consultants, specifically folks seeking the Canadian Management Consultant designation. We also have a, uh, a Good Governance Matters course that we created in partnership with the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives. We introduced um, the Co-ops in Canada course in partnership with ISED to, uh, to train BDC, ISED, and program officers within the federal government. And we've just introduced, geez, back in uh, April, the Intro to Co-ops course which provides a micro-learning approach for folks that are interested in understanding what a co-op is, how they work, and how to start one. In the fall, we'll be expanding that to also focus on a professional's um, pathway for folks who are already working in a co-op or are new members of a co-op or a new board member, so that, again, they can get a good snapshot and get some other questions answered. And since we've introduced them cumulatively, we've had about 3,000 learners go through these courses um, yeah, over the past few years. And finally, probably our most intensive sort of support. Yes, we're going to be taking one of those later. This <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of our more intensive supports are our hands-on startup supports, which is really our bread and butter, and it's also what kind of gives us the warm fuzzies, I guess. Because you're working with cool groups, we're working with entrepreneurs, who need technical support through that startup process, and we help them start their businesses. We help them open housing co-ops, get child care, um, you name it. The process that we have in place for that is inspired by the Plunkett Foundation. Folks might be familiar with it. It's from the United Kingdom. But we adapted that to some of the realities here in Western Canada. But the goal of that really is to create a robust approach to co-op development, one that supports groups right in the early stages through their startup journey, uh, to incorporating a business, getting a business plan in place and applying for financing, as well as getting an early training for governance. And to date, we've worked with about 175 groups, and that's led to about 60 new co-ops. Um, I ran some of the numbers earlier, and we've got most sectors of the economy covered, but without a doubt, our most popular types of co-ops are community service co-ops, and then a good mix of marketing, uh, multi-stakeholder, worker, and consumer. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. I am Pascal Villa from CoopZone. Do you know CoopZone? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I was a, a founding member. I was president for five, five years, four years ago. And um, some years ago, I met uh, Ultra Google. And I tried to establish a link with uh, two organizations, but no result because no time for my I uh, no time to develop this uh, link. And uh, as you see, my English is so bad, but, uh, yeah. but I think there is possibility, also possibility to establish a link between the two organizations. You are in the West. Comzone is in all Canada, but you can concentrate on uh, mission in. Is, uh, my question is uh, how do you uh, find money to offer 
free tourism because uh, uh, and training program, but we, it's impossible to offer food. We, uh, we, we ask to, to our students to, to pay because it's the main source of revenue of Kurdistan yeah. and the market. But where can you uh, perform? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess for folks joining through online, um, the question was about links with Co-op Zone, which is a developer's network, and how do we offer free tools? Because funding is, of course, a barrier. Um, without a doubt, most of our funding comes from Federated Co-op. They fund us a million dollars per year, uh, and we, they initially committed to five years, and now we've had a continuity of that. So that really frees up the time and resources to dedicate to creating both the infrastructure, uh, the learning tools, all this outreach, um, and then some of the supports for groups. Um, so that's mostly where it comes from. We've also had a few um, contract things over the years. For example, the Co-ops in Canada course, that was a contract we had with the federal government to create that course, and that one's offered, of course, in English and French. Um, but then we also look for efficiencies and synergies. One of the big lessons I'll get into in a minute is don't reinvent the wheel. Or find ways to work with other things. So for example, I know Co-op Zone um, has the developers training. Um, I know a number of folks who've gone through our Creating Connections workshop, which is a professional development workshop, and then go on and take um, Co-op developers training. Um, we've had a number of folks who we've worked with over the years, Marty Frost, Zoe, um, on the same projects. When groups kind of need our sorts of supports, they can come to us, and we often fill in just certain parts of the process, and then they can continue working with the quad developer. Certainly having someone locally, for example, folks who work in the Kootenays, it's very handy to have Zoe right there to answer questions more readily than we can, and of course she's more familiar with um, BC-based processes and the, the granting landscape um, in that area. Um, so yeah, we look for efficiencies wherever we can, but we're also able to be freed up to do a lot of this work because of our funding arrangement with FCL. Great question. Any other questions? All good. So very quickly, just to summarize some of those results that we've seen in our first six years, Cooperative First currently manages three online courses as well as three workshops. We do that over three websites and three unique newsletters. We've put out over 100, probably closer to 150 articles, um, usually in blog format. We've got 40 plus uh, podcasts with experts telling stories and, uh, and sharing their experience. And we've put out probably 50 to 60 tools, primarily on the Co-op Creator and the Your Way Together website. We've had over 3,000 learners connect with us through online courses and workshops, and we get about 2,700 weekly site visits. And that's led to 175 projects and eventually about 60 new co-ops. So as you can even see from the numbers, a key theme of this is you need to cast a gigantic net. And at each part of that process, it gets even more and more narrowed. So even though we get 3,000 people that was for 2,700 per week coming to our site to learn a bit more. We're trying to reach thousands, millions, but we're only getting a small portion of those. Even a smaller portion are engaging closely with us, and very, very few are starting, of course, new co-ops. So a huge theme, a key learning for us was that we need to cast that big net, get co-ops as part of it, as many conversations as possible to get some of the outcomes and really work towards creating that new wave of new co-ops. Any questions before I move on to our next section? No? Yes, Vanessa. Why do people not go to you? Why do people not go to us? Yes. Oh, a variety of reasons. Um, often because they haven't heard of us. Um, I read tons of folks say that, um, well, I didn't know you guys existed. It's, it's really helpful when they do eventually come sometimes. Um, lots of folks, when they search co-ops, they'll see Alberta Community Co-op Association. They'll give them a call and hopefully connect with Seth. Um, 
That's quite common. Um, we also know that the co-ops we start aren't the only co-ops being started in Western Canada from the federal government data. Um, lots of folks can just have to do it themselves. They work with lawyers and accountants. Another target audience that we know is important to loop in. Um, yeah, any number of reasons. Yeah. But we do try hard. <laughs> we try hard to get out there. Yeah. All right, in this next section, which is probably the last section where I'll be doing most of the talking, um, I'll give a bit of an overview of four key ideas that I want to share. Some of these are going to seem obvious, but I'll share some stories as well that uh, helped guide our work and, and what we learned when it came to developing a strategy and advancing co-op education. So, those four ideas, fairly simple, we should know these as educators, understand your learners. And I can't stress this enough, always start here. Always start there. Uh, if you can, build within existing networks. There is, oh dear, no one need, no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, if you can, and where possible, identify gaps. Don't duplicate. We're the co-op sector. We don't need to be the competing sector. And finally, continuous improvement. Refine or retry, and don't be ashamed if you have to do it. I initially had that call, throw it out and try again. Some folks thought that was a bit too aggressive. <laughs> so, first up, let's talk about understanding your learners. We're educators. This is the Association of Co-op Educators. We have to start with our learners. Whenever we create a project, and we usually have a, a template, a product plan, we call it, at Cooperatives First, the first question we always ask is, who is this for? Way too often in the economic and commu the community and economic development space, I see a tool or an action plan or a set of resources that's for everybody. And as a result, it's for nobody. And it doesn't get used. We don't want that. We put a lot of hard work into our tools and resources. We need people to connect with them. So for that reason, that's why we have, for example, three websites. We have three newsletters. We have five social media accounts. We need to connect with people in a way that makes sense to them, speaking their language, addressing their problems, and identifying with that group. That's how we do that. We always ask who this is for, and we keep that central to how we build the product. We also do a rigorous exercise regularly. Usually, once a year, we'll sit down and map out who our audiences are. Who are the folks we're trying to get in front of? And what are they doing? Where are they? What does their day-to-day -day look like? What are their goals? What are their motivations? What are they stressed out about? Where do they live? Do they have access to internet? Is a huge question for how we're going to be able to hit them. What challenges do they face? And how can we help solve some of those challenges? Can co-ops? help solve some of those challenges. Mapping out those audiences and those learners, absolutely essential. And a lot of that work is informed by a design thinking framework. We use that to really create a persona for those individuals. So we literally put a face and a name to the folks that we're creating these tools for. That helps us align what we're creating, how we're marketing it, and how we're getting word about it out there with its intended user. We always keep the learner and the intended user central whenever we're creating any of our products. So some of the learners that we work on, or work with and work for at Cooperatives First, are most broadly people who want to start cooperatives. Also, yes, that's me, without a beard. <laughs> I realized that after I put it in there. I was like, oh. <laughs> so our primary audience, of course, is people who want to start cooperatives. Oftentimes, though, people who want to start cooperatives don't know they want to start cooperatives. So we need to hit them sooner. We need to get co-ops a part of that conversation. So the folks who we really work hard to connect with, um, without a doubt, I would say the best audience that we've been able to connect with are economic development professionals. Uh, most communities have one. It's the, your local economic development officer, your economic development manager. It's the folks who work in your community futures office. Um, sometimes they're consultants. 
um, folks that are on the front lines working with communities, governments, community leaders, entrepreneurs, nonprofits, helping them figure out how to start businesses. Nine times out of ten, they're telling people about three ways to do business. Co ops aren't one of them. <laughs> with, if I swear to God, if I had a penny, for every time I see a brochure or a toolkit or a handbook that say you can start a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation, I have like 30 pennies. But that's still like too many. That's way too many. We also work with entrepreneurs, people who start businesses, of course, often go on and start more businesses. And of course, oh dear, we're seeing lots of opportunities. Um, for folks who are business owners to work together cooperatively to better adapt to changing markets. So chambers of commerce, business associations, groups like that are who we try to connect with and get some resources out there and get co-ops as part of that conversation. We work with business supporters, whether that's in finance or providing tools like Small Business BC, who does have a big write-up on co-ops on their website. Kudos to them. Uh, many still don't. We work with financial institutions, groups like Aboriginal financial institutions, uh, as well as folks in the government, the Government of Canada, program officers who are on the front line. Um, other folks who we've identified as key targets that we currently aren't really getting in front of right now, lawyers, accountants, other members of the general public who we're not even sure yet, but folks who are helping people start businesses, giving advice to folks, and what we do know is they're probably not advising people to start co-ops. And we need to change that. So for each audience, we develop a couple of personas that guides the stories we tell, the examples that we use, and how we try to connect with them. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Yeah, so the thing that's sort of interesting that's not on the list, and I was just curious as to why not or what the mm -hmm. it was, uh, was education, so K-12 as well as universities. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know if that was like on the property's first agenda, mm -hmm. something that you think is being done by the British Columbia and Alberta Association, or how do you think about that? Yeah, it's definitely on our radar. We do know that some of our partners do that work. I know at least in SC, uh, uh, Saskatchewan Co-op Association, they lead youth camps both summer camps as well as kind of day camps in schools. I know BC and Alberta have great youth programs. Um, Manitoba, I know, still does some stuff, but essentially we know folks are doing it, and we don't have the time yet to figure out exactly how to work on that, but it's definitely on our radar, and we're always open to collaborations as well. But to date, we haven't done much with formal learning institutions. Um, yeah. And we definitely, I would say in the university space, we do work with some partners to get co-ops as part of conversations. Certainly um, at USAS Business, we've worked with Blue Quills, uh, an indigenous university. Um, yeah, where those opportunities present themselves, we're definitely there to help out. But, uh, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Next big learning. Build within existing networks, and if possible, don't reinvent the wheel. It took a long time to build wheels. <laughs> I think, I don't know. Maybe not. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the Cooperative Innovation Project realized that there was a shortage of tools and resources for co-ops. The kind that folks were looking for, they just really couldn't access. Um, however, when we were creating some of those things, we knew that, well, this is a resource-intensive process. This takes a lot of time, and as a team of six, we're kind of short on both. So we had to identify efficiencies as best as possible. So when it came to putting together our development process, the SIP project did a large part of that and drew on the Plunkett organization in the UK to help with that. We regularly partner with academic partners, namely those at the University of Saskatchewan when it comes to course development. For example, our, our Good Governance Matters course, I co-teach with my colleague Jen Budney, and it uses a framework that was designed by researchers at the university. When it came to putting together tools and templates and how-to guides, we drew on an assortment of the things that were already out there in other jurisdictions from the states, like the University of Wisconsin, 
um, as well as design for corporate organizations or the nonprofit space. We took some of those ideas and used them as inspiration and co-opified them, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. That's a cool word. Um, really designed those so that they met co-ops where they are. Because, of course, it is a different way of doing business, and that needed to be reflected in the tools and templates that we were giving to folks. Our team also works to identify organizations that have similar goals to us, groups that help want to create businesses and have healthy Western Canadian communities. So again, some of those really include uh, active associations, business supporters, and chambers. And we figure out how do we best work with them. What does it look like to be advantageous for them? So for example, when it comes to economic development associations, um, those I would say are probably the lion's share of conferences and in-person groups that I've attended. Um, how do we work with them and provide value to each other? How do we get co-ops part of the conversation that they're having? So some of the ways we've done that is we simply just provide member, provide members materials. We have brochures, we have write-ups about co-ops, we've got blurbs that can go on websites. So if you go to the World Trade Center in Winnipeg, they'll have some co-op brochures. If you go to some community futures offices, they now have co-op brochures. We just get material out there so that the folks they're working with, their clients and their communities, can see some of that material. Uh, we speak at conferences. We give free webinars. Um, this gets topical conversations going with communities. I know right now, uh, a very hot topic in the ECDEF space is community investing and community investment co-ops. That's something we've been asked to speak on quite a bit. I know in Alberta, uh, Seth has spoken at a number of events and hosted some webinars. Um, it's a very hot topic that folks are very interested in now, especially as rural communities are seeing a drain of capital from financial institutions away from their communities. And training members. One thing I've learned in my years of working with economic development is economic development professionals love training and education, which is great for us as co-op educators. So when we created our Creating Connections workshop, we thought, how can we create some value for folks that aligns with what they're doing and meets them where they are? So we worked with active associations like the Economic Development Association of Canada, uh, the same organization in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, and got those workshops accredited so folks can use that workshop towards their professional development, their ECD certification, um, or their, their professional certification as economic developers. Really a win-win. We're not reinventing wheels, we're not creating new approaches for hitting folks. We're figuring out how we fit into those processes, and more broadly, how co-ops become part of that conversation. So when creating an education strategy or developing a new tool or product, Take pause, take a look around, do an environmental scan, and figure out, figure out, is there another organization doing similar work? One with a similar audience or one with a common goal? Can you work with those organizations? Are there efficiencies that you can find? And can you take existing work, if you do need to create something, and improve upon it? Some of the things that we've put out into the world for the co-op creator or our online courses, we do it for free. We don't have, I don't think, any terrifying intellectual property wrapped up in it. Um, folks can use it. Take it. Use it. Use it in your own work. Translate it. Use it with the groups you work with. Um, we know from our analytics that our tools are already being used and translated in the U.S., Russia, Turkey, uh, and the Philippines. So folks in Canada are certainly most welcome to it. Oddly enough, our most popular blog that we've ever written, unfortunately, is 10 Reasons Co-ops Fail. Hmm. Not the most positive article, uh, but it got picked up by a couple of magazines, uh, including a Turkish newspaper or a Turkish a Turkish newspaper website, and just translated, and it gets hundreds of hits per day. It's anyway. Oh well, at least it tells them what not to do. Uh, any questions before I go on? Yeah. So um, I appreciate as you know you're taking a very pedagogical approach and. and so when you work with uh, the University of Saskatchewan or other universities, again, is it a contractual type of thing or is it a professional courtesy? Are they doing that for you? Are you hiring? Like, how is that working, that mm -hmm. type of um, relationship? For sure. So the question was, um, what does the relationship look like when we partner on certain things? It, I would say it depends on the partnership. 
So for example, with the, government, with the governance course, we contracted the center uh, to provide that course, and then once it was created and we figured out how that worked, um, that was again something we just figured out in a contract. Um, since then, it's moved to our learning management system, um, so it's us also providing some support to that, and then two of us co-teach it. Um, so yeah, we just kind of figure it out on a case-by-case -case basis. But where it makes sense to contract groups to do work, we've done that. Um, for our, like the active associations, that's just, we have a little bit of a partnership, um, but not really formal. Um, yeah, case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. So. Identify gaps. There we go. Um, so our team is super small. As I mentioned, we, we were five people for a few years. Now we're six. We realized pretty early on that we can't really spend our time duplicating services. <clears throat> so each of our learning tools, and I'm giving very, very brief overviews of the things that we offer here. If you check them out, you'll get a much deeper dive into what it is those things actually look like. For example, when I say governance course, our governance course doesn't look like other governance courses. Um, there's lots of organizations providing governance. John, with Real Life Strategies, for example, they have a great um, set of tools and, and offerings around governance. Our stuff is very specific to the fundamental questions around how groups work together. It's unlike any other governance course I've ever seen, and it really hits a niche in the market. Our governance uh, workshop, or our board basics workshop, Again, very niche. There's lots of training for boards, telling them how they can do strategy, do finance, what have you. Our workshop is designed specifically for the clients we work with, and the goal of it is really to prepare them for that first annual meeting. So what do you guys need to do in year one to get ready for the rest of the, the co-op's life? That's really, we, we, again, we target specifically the gaps in the ecosystem and the pain points that our clients are feeling, and we try to fill those as best we can. So for example, some of the ways we do that is we put in some legwork to inform the tools that we're going to create and what they actually look like. So for example, when we first got going, we recognized quickly that economic development would be a key audience for us, so we just did a survey at a couple of different events. We reached out to folks and said, can you just let us know what your understanding of co-ops is? It was kind of low, unfortunately. Um, are you interested in learning about co-ops? What would that look like? Would you be interested in a workshop, a course, a tool, a template? What, what's that look like? Um, and we got some input right from folks that would be using that. And eventually that led to the creation of our Creating Connections workshop. A workshop is good, a course was too much. It's good to understand how folks are going to engage with it and, and where that is located. Um, we also did a course on environmental scan, drawing on some of the work of the SIP projects. So again, we know from the co-op research, or the co-op innovation projects research, that the presence of co-ops in business education and economic development training is underrepresented. We know this. And as a result, co-ops are missing from most business support, support discussions, and they're not usually considered by entrepreneurs. As I mentioned, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that there's three ways of doing business, I would have a lot of dollars. Um, so again, when we identify those gaps, we not only look within the co-op space and what our partners and other agencies are doing, but we have to look more expansive. How are other business supporters and other um, organizations like us, but with a broader scope, how are they reaching folks, and how can we work with them, how can we fill their gaps, and ensure that co-ops are part of the conversation. And the last point has to be continuous improvement. And this is kind of the painful one. Because when you spend years creating something and you put it out there, it's kind of hard to say that it's not perfect. It's kind of hard to say, well, this sucks. We need to try again. But a big learning is you cannot set it and forget it. That's how things end up dusty on bookshelves and underused. And we work in a dynamic environment. Things change all the time. Who knew in 2018 we were going to have to move all of our tools and resources and learning 
to an online environment. We've had to shift a lot of our governance tools to things that you can then adapt to a Zoom AGM, for example. Um, we didn't know that. We, but you need to not just let those things happen, you need to be prepared for it and do that work when it's necessary. So, don't throw it out and try again. Refine and retry. We put a lot of effort into planning, uh, and we also try to make sure that they're working properly. Without a doubt, data has to be a part of that. Again, we know how many folks are visiting our tools, we know roughly how long they're spending on the site, and we know by tracking through our, our, our CRM and our LMS how far folks are getting along with our tools and resources and who among those then go on to connect with us again and again and again, and maybe eventually they create a co-op. So it's important to understand the role of data, and that really helps you understand your impact more broadly. But with each of our products, all the things we've talked about, um, at least once a year, where we sit down and we ask, can we make this a little bit better? Should we update this? Many of our things, of course, I mentioned we tell stories. Are there better stories we can be telling? Are what we're talking about today not necessarily relevant anymore? How do we make things improvement? How do we make things improved? How do we make things more relevant? How do we, again, meet our learners where they are to keep them engaged? And I'm being honest, we aren't perfect. I have definitely had to throw it out and try again, quite literally. We draw on our HubSpot tool, our, our learning management system, and that informs whether or not things are working. And we, again, we take that data at its face value and try to understand how we can improve it to turn things around. We've held workshops with two people showing up. That one hurts, right? We've introduced services that zero people requested. And we've lost people on their learning journey. I see where they are in the course, they make it to page seven of module two, and they're gone. We lose them. But what we can do is with that data, and with the framework that we have in place for understanding our learners and questioning ourselves, we can reevaluate, and we can either refine our process, or we can try something different. For workshops, that might be identifying different channels for reaching that audience and getting the word out there about the workshop. So that the next workshop we have, we have 35 people joining with us. We can rethink our startup process by interviewing past clients. We can ask them, at what parts of the startup process were you hitting pain points? What were the stressors? What could we have done to better support you in that journey? So then we can rework our process, narrow some of our services, and really figure out how to provide supports that help them. So we scrapped things like the biz dev refresh. That was a product we once offered. It's gone now. And we instead offer business, business planning support, something most folks need. And we offer our board basics workshop. Again, something groups we were finding needed again and again. And in some cases, we pump the brakes and we recognize that certain things, like our course, some courses, have just outlived their utility. A number of years ago, we introduced a course called Co-ops 101. The audience for that was probably too broad, but it worked pretty good for the first year or two. We saw attendance go down quite a bit. We saw um, completion go way down. And eventually we said, you know, it's probably not working. The effort it would take to recreate it and revise it Probably a bit too hard. Let's just take that as the learning and plan for the next thing from there. If something's not working, ask if it can be improved. Then ask, what's the best use of your resources? Any questions about those four ideas? I hope that's helpful. Any questions at all? I have a tech question. What, what, um, what do you use for your learning management? It's a custom one that's been built for us. So it's integrated through our WordPress, um, and our web developer has designed it for us. Um, but yeah, it builds off of WordPress with a couple of applications. Yeah. But what's helpful about that is it gives me, like literally me, in the back end, all the control so we can better respond to problems and make adjustments. We don't need to wait on a, a third party right. to fix things. Yeah. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Or any learnings from you guys? I've talked about four really big things that I've learned in reflection from the work that we've been doing. Are there any learnings as co-op educators that you guys would like to share?
Also, Saskatchewan has arguably the most co-ops, I would say, of the four Western provinces. I think I'm right in saying that. Um, so I, part of that could also be that folks in Saskatchewan are just, well, we try to co-op for this, let's try a co-op for that. I think there is a part of that, especially in rural communities. Um, yeah, and then the big trend we've noticed was the pandemic. 2020 was the year where we created the most co-ops. And that's because people had time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People were laid off. People were working from home. Eh, why not do a side project? We had a bunch of groups start co-ops in, uh, in 2020. Both start the project, but also incorporate the co-op in 2020. Uh, and in 2021, that fell off. Probably not of the groups we've worked with. Yeah, sorry, the question was, was it because folks lost their jobs? I don't think a lot of the groups we worked with fell in that category. Some were directly related to the pandemic. For example, we helped create a child care cooperative called the At Risk Together Co-op, ART Co-op. Um, yeah. Um, and the intent is to provide child care services and education for immunocompromised children in Saskatchewan because in the public school system, that need was not being addressed. Uh, and we also helped create the Blooming Ladies Cooperative. It's an online workspace for predominantly black women who are doing uh, virtual assistant work, who are doing consulting gigs, uh, creating a bit of a hub for them to connect with clients. So some of it's very pandemic related, but other stuff was, uh, was just ordinary co-ops, but a lot more of them. Yeah, just a, a sort of a thought question. Um, if the reason why you get more clients from Saskatchewan is based in Saskatchewan, yeah. um, is it, have you thought about it or tried to do like a mirror sites in other mm -hmm. areas? You know, you can get the, you know, the CBA or something mm -hmm. to, to like post on to the site and just go to the mirror site afterwards? It's possible. I, my, my colleague Dan is definitely the one to answer that question. Because understanding exactly how Google AdWords and some of the analytics work, I th I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's partially where the credit card is attached to. If you're buying an ad, for example, if that's attached to our Saskatchewan address, I think by nature of the system, um, Saskatchewan folks will just see it more. I know. That'd be ideal. Yeah. But, but I would definitely say the two areas we get the most are definitely Saskatchewan and BC. So, hard to say. Yeah, hard to say. Any other questions before we move on to our last section? So just in terms of future goals, and I thought I'd open this up and, again, get some discussion going with you guys, is as co-op educators, what else do we need to be doing? I know we're all doing our own work. One comment that was made today is that sometimes co-op groups do operate in silos, but really if we want to get co-op education out there as best as we can, um, who else do we need to engage in co-op education? What partnerships can we create to maximize that impact? Any thoughts from folks on, on any of these questions? Yeah? Well, I actually wanted to just ask another, another question. Sure. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of co-op education that's happening in the rural communities, and I'm just curious about and something I've been thinking a lot about as I've been trying to develop a strategy in those provinces is, um, you know, recognizing that the co-op sector doesn't exist in a vacuum outside of all of the various social, political, economic issues that we face in the world and oppression and all these things, colonialism and all these things. Um, how is education as an entry point into the sector like a part of trying to dismantle that, right? And, and trying to make the clock space a place that everyone is is welcome and is supporting everyone. And so I'm curious if, if you at Clocks First, as you've been developing these resources, have like tried to integrate some sort of like anti-oppression lens or like tried to think about yeah different things. Like I mean, I'm presuming you have some work on indigenous communities and stuff, but I've been thinking a lot about that. I'd love to know what you've been doing or anyone else has been thinking about 
that. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll maybe take a crack first. Um, the question, folks, was um, how we try to incorporate an anti-impression lens um, into some of the work, education work that we do. And yeah, as you say, I mean, definitely we really try to put a concerted effort on um, being more inclusive and really creating content and, and supports for groups that are in indigenous communities. Um, both in our education work, in how we talk as an organization, um, and all of our staff, of course, do, do training on, on how to best support indigenous clients that we have. Um, we know we need to do more, certainly both on that front and with other, um, other groups. Um, yeah, anybody else want to weigh in on how we can use education on that front? For us, for me personally, again, one of my big, I used to, I was an educator in another life too, um, and uh, for me, uh, you know, participating with with First Nations communities and so on and so forth is very important. I also find it very challenging to uh, even get an audience to be able to, 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 and I'm not coming from a place of where I'm trying to go in there and tell them what to do. I'm coming from a place where I'd like to, to learn more about, because I have a firm belief that all of the cooperative stuff that we're, that's been formalized, this colonial system and all that kind of stuff, there are, um, that's a formalized system, but that principles and actions in a cooperative style have existed in these communities, whether it's you know African countries or in Asia or South America, or that's existed. We've formalized it, put a label on it, and, and that's fine. So, uh, or not fine, but that's, I, I understand that's where we're coming from. So I think, you know, when we talk about co-op education, just having opportunities for dialogue and unpack or um, unpacking this type of stuff is important to share about, you know, and, and then the question is, okay, well, if we've laid, if we've laid all this stuff on the table, then how can we now make space for your story to come forward mm -hmm. and, 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 and do that kind of thing. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that the cooperative movement, that the, the, you know, whether it's formalized or not, you know, they're, they're very shared, similar approaches. And it could be act as a basis for, you know, a, a way to move forward on certain questions as well. But it's, I, I find it, and, and well, rightfully so, if, if, if groups have circled the wagons because they've been burned and burned and burned and burned, I get it. So for me, and I'm very conscious also about how do we talk, even approach and ask, makes me very nervous to do anything wrong, you know, like or it. So I, anyway, so I would I would argue that trying to create spaces with dialogue is there is probably a key forward in, in that particular. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave one thought on this, which is really co-creation of resources. Mm -hmm. so the, the Minister of Indigenous Business Alliance worked with cooperatives first to actually create a co-op resource for First Nations people in Minnesota. So that's an example of doing that. I mean, I know in my own work, so I'm doing like articles, so I've done more article series with First Nations Development Institute. I don't pretend I'm not Indigenous myself, but I don't pretend to be for Indigenous people, but I partner with those trusted Hard to, to develop those. Of course. I would agree with you 100%. I think for me personally, and I don't uh, pretend that it's for anybody else, but it's how do you, like, did the indigenous group approach co ops first or did co ops first approach them? And who took the first step and who was able to, the, you know, initiate that discussion? Mm -hmm. That's for me the. the one of the issues that I face personally. Yeah, I, I think the answer, although I don't know for sure, I wasn't there. Yeah. You, you are, so maybe you do know, but I think it had to do with Krista and yeah. down, right? So, it was based on, so they had somebody on staff who was a first Nations person who had a relationship. Um, I think that's how they did it. I was going to say, this is something we work on all the time as an organization. Having Trista lead this discussion is super helpful. Trista's our, uh, from the Little Pine First Nation and has worked in economic development and, and uh, with the corporate sector for a lot of years and has seen a lot of the problems, I think, in that. Not just seen, probably. Oh, absolutely. 
And uh, so she's definitely identified areas for us to work on. We, of course, then work with companies that have expertise in this. We work with, say, an indigenous communications company to better understand how do we best serve and speak to or speak with um, indigenous communities. Um, so that helps us inform what we put together. We work with experts, for sure, um, all with a goal, essentially, of being at least welcoming and having those conversations get started. Because more often than not, when a group approaches us wanting to start a co-op, it is the group approaching us. Um, and usually that's because they've either identified with something we've said at an event. Trista's, without a doubt, the best networker I think we have. She'll always say that, you know, I met this person in the bathroom. And <laughs> I'm like, all right, <laughs> that's cool. Um, I'm just kidding, kind of. Not really, no. But, uh, yeah, being welcoming, I would say, and being open to those conversations is definitely where that needs to start. Yeah. yeah. And then hopefully folks can take you up on that, and it gives you experiences to learn from. Because this is the other thing, is we've done this now for six years, which feels like a longer time, uh, partially because the pandemic felt like five years. <laughs> um, but learning from those experiences and adapting from it, absolutely, yeah, absolutely essential. I hope that answers the question a little bit. I don't know what we are on time. Like I was originally I'm just, I'm just checking right now. I'm, um, so I'm sure we're not the only ones who are behind. But I was going to say maybe we have time for maybe one more comment or question discussion. I was kind of hoping maybe quarter past 20 past to be related. Okay. We were assigned an hour and a half for lunch, so I think we're perhaps trying to catch up a little bit on the time we lost this morning for that. But I think we have time for one more. If there are any more comments to be made. That means any questions, comments, thoughts, learnings? Going once? <laughs> Going twice? Well, if, <laughs> if there are no other questions, then please do connect with us, connect with me. I've got some cards if folks want them. Alternatively, if you don't like paper or you lose business cards like I do, feel free, take a picture, shoot me an email. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. Um, but yeah, please do stay in touch, check out our stuff, use our stuff, and uh, I hope to hear from you guys again after the event. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also just like to take this opportunity to remind you that the QR code on the front of your badge is your LinkedIn so if you are not having, if you don't have a card, or if you run out of cards, like I did at one conference, what you can do is you can, you know, aim your lens at the QR code, and that'll take you directly to that person's LinkedIn profile, and you can connect with them directly that way. So please take advantage of that if you haven't already. I thought it's actually pretty cool. Also, I promise we'll be doing one of these selfies. Post smile.
house. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> They'd be interested to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard for we, we also had one of them relate from the... I don't know what it was, but it was... Oh, I got this, I thought about it. Well, that's good. Yeah.